Fanny Hurst was a prolific Jewish writer and a major celebrity who regularly graced the pages of newspapers and magazines. In total, she published 18 novels, 90 short stories, five plays, and two memoirs between 1912 and her death in 1968. Her work was immensely popular with audiences, which earned her a huge amount of money, but in general, her stories were panned by critics. Hollywood, however, disagreed, and in total, 29 Hollywood films were produced based on her work. While her literary legacy has been somewhat forgotten, the influences of her work on film can be seen as recently as the 1990s. Here's Fanny Hurst, novelist, and Lummox, her lapdog. It's December 2nd, 1928, and Miss Hurst and Pat are at a benefit in New York for animal hospitals. Writer of best-selling novels, Miss Fanny Hurst. Fanny was an extremely well-known liberal and was active in organizations promoting racial equality, including the NAACP and the Urban League. In addition to her political activism, Fanny was a valued patron of both Zora Neale Hurston and Langston Hughes and made significant contributions to the black artistic community. So much so that in 1946, John H. Johnson, the editor of Negro Digest, wrote to Fanny to ask her to contribute an article to be part of a collection titled If I Were a Negro. He wrote, We here at Negro Digest know that you belong among the allies of the Negro and his efforts to attain equality under American democracy. Your frank and outspoken expressions and actions in the past merit the thanks of every American Negro. Fanny was a champion for gender equality. This attitude is reflected in her alternative style of marriage that became known as the Fanny Hurst marriage, and entailed being legally married, but living in separate residences, as she did until the death of her late husband, Jacques Danielson, in 1952. Danielson was a Jewish-Russian pianist who Fanny married secretly in 1915. They kept the marriage a secret at first due to concerns of racism from Fanny's family, who, although Jewish themselves, used anti-Semitic slurs to refer to other Jewish people and forbid Fanny from marrying within their religion. Fanny herself had a complicated relationship with Judaism. In her autobiography, Anatomy of Me, she writes that she was embarrassed by the foreignness of Orthodox Jews and by the excessive consumption of wealthier ones. She only developed a sense of Jewishness in the last decades of her life, and while she did write about Jewish people in Humoresque and in Lummox, she didn't relate to them personally. Fanny's influential status as a high-profile author, coupled with her progressive political ideology, allowed for her entrance into the same social circles as the most prominent Black figures of the Harlem Renaissance. However, while she was being celebrated by some prominent black figures, others, notably Sterling Brown, took issue with her portrayal of black characters, specifically in her best-selling novel Imitation of Life, published in 1933, and the hit movie adaption released in 1934. While certainly a prolific and influential writer who earned a front-page obituary in the New York Times, Fanny Hurst has, in general, disappeared from popular culture. This presentation will consider the reactions of Hurston, Hughes, and Brown to Imitation of Life, and ultimately ask whether Fanny Hurst should be remembered as a valuable patron of the arts or forgotten as a problematic figure from the past. Imitation of Life was published in 1933 and was so popular that only a year later it was adapted into a movie that also became a bestseller. While there are small differences and omissions in the movie, for example, the replacement of waffles with pancakes, in general, no substantive change exists in the characterization and social ideas set forth in the novel. Reception in the Black community was in general positive, with both Hurston and Hughes praising the work. 
However, Sterling Brown was critical of the stereotypical characterizations of the black characters. Sterling's critique would go on to become a public argument between the two writers. Imitation of Life ended up having just this extraordinary impact on the African-American community because it was really the one Hollywood film of the Depression era that suggested there was such a thing as a contemporary race problem in America. I'm not black. I'm not black. I won't be black. It tells the story of two women, a black woman and a white woman. Yes, and good morning. Each is without a husband. Each has a young daughter to raise. At one point in, in the movie, the black woman is preparing breakfast for the white woman. The white woman's so impressed with her pancakes. I've never tasted anything so good in all my life. How do you make them? It's a secret. And it's going to die with Delilah. She gives the recipe to the white woman. The white woman eventually markets a mix based on that recipe. And then in one sequence that today is unbelievable to us, the white woman offers the black woman a 20% interest in the company. Well, of course, this is very kind of the white woman, uh, particularly since without the black woman, there would have been no company whatsoever. Heartache comes to the two women in imitation of life because of their daughters. And for the black woman, the great heartache comes when her daughter decides to cross the color line and pass for white. At the end of a party that Claudette Colbert, the white woman, has given, and now she's made all this money off this pancake recipe. And at the end of the party, she and Delilah, played by Louise Beavers, uh, they're talking, and Delilah is still subservient. And at the end of the evening, they say good night to each other. And as they go to their separate quarters, we see this beautiful home that really Louise Beavers' pancake recipe has built. We see Claudette Colbert ascend up the steps and Louise Beavers descends downstairs. And it's visually just striking that John Stahl has just put it there. In response to the movie, Sterling Brown penned a review titled Imitation of Life, Once a Pancake, in reference to one of the film's most problematic scenes. While he admired the performance of black actors Louise Beavers as Delilah and Freddie Washington as her daughter Piola, Brown wrote that readers should reject the racist stereotypes perpetuated by Fanny of the contented mammy and the tragic mulatto. Brown specifically took issue with the dialect that Delilah speaks and the particularly poignant moment we just witnessed of Miss B going upstairs and Delilah going down. In response, Fanny replied to Brown's review, calling him both unintelligent and ungrateful, claiming that the film has important social value because it includes Black Americans as part of the social pattern of American life. Brown, in response to Hearst's accusations, concedes that non-Black writers have contributed some of the best interpretations of Black life, but that he does not consider Fanny to be one of them and he soundly rejects any type of social value that the movie might be said to have. While both Langston Hughes and Zora Neale Hurston were supportive of imitation of life to Hurst's face, they both ultimately rejected her work in their writing. It is possible that Hughes and Hurston's initial reactions were influenced by their financial and social reliance on Fanny, and that their subsequent reactions indicate how they actually felt. I ain't gonna do it, Miss B. No, ma'am, I ain't gonna do it. I don't know why I bother about all this. I've gone without my dinner. I barnstormed over here in the snow to tell her she's on Easy Street. And I get just as far as a stranded dogfish on the Barnegat Shoals. Now, you tell her. <laughs> now, look, Delilah. We've made $15,000 in the last six months. We'll double that by July and make 100000 next year. So now we want to incorporate. 
Yes, sir. You see, that's the best way to run a business. Yes, sir. Now, here are the papers for you to sign. But if I sign them, then what? Then you'll have a 20% interest in the Aunt Delilah Corporation. You'll be rich. You'll have your own car, your own house. My own house? You gonna send me away, Miss B? I can't live with you? Oh, honey child, please don't send me away. Don't do that to me. Well, don't you want your own house? No. How am I gonna take care of you and Miss Jessie if I ain't here? Oh, Delilah. Delilah, you'll have me in tears in a minute. Let me and Piola stay the same as we've been doing. I's your cook, and I want to stay your cook. Well, of course you can stay, Delilah. I only thought now that the money's coming in, and after all, it's all from your pancake flour. I gives it to you, honey. I makes you a present of it. You's welcome. Oh, Delilah, you're hopeless. I could have told you that. Well, I'll simply have to put the money in the bank for you. Well, that's all right, honey. If you want to, against my funeral. I does hanker for a good funeral. Once a pancake, always a pancake. In 1938, Hughes mounted a play called Limitations of Life that centered around the pancake scene we just saw. Set in Harlem, Hughes' play recasts the main characters so that the pancake-making housekeeper is white and the matriarch is a black woman in an evening gown who speaks perfect English with an Oxford accent. The play, produced by the Harlem Suitcase Theater, was a great success with black audiences, but not with white ones. In contrast with Hughes, Zora Neale Hurston never entirely abandoned Hearst's friendship. After meeting in 1925, Hurston became Hearst's secretary and then after they had established that Hurston was a poor secretary, she became Fanny's chauffeur. Hurston pushed back against Sterling Brown's contention that imitation of life was based on her own relationship with Fanny. And while Hurston never publicly disparaged Hurst, in her 1942 glossary of Harlem slang, Hurston includes certain terms that seem to acknowledge that Hearst's portrayal of black characters is if not outright racist, at least inauthentic. In fact, some academics have read Hurston's novel, Their Eyes Were Watching God, as a response to imitation of life, given some striking similarities between characters in the two novels. In conclusion, while it cannot be denied that throughout her life, Fanny Hurst worked towards ideals of racial and gender equality, she held progressive liberal views, and she made significant financial contributions to the Harlem Renaissance, it is important to also remember her reliance on racist stereotypes and her unacceptable response to Sterling Brown's legitimate critique.